So what George Washington did is he took the militia units and he forced them <laughs> into his strategy that he wanted to use. And guess what happened? The, they got their I, asses kicked. I know the answer. <laughs> they got their asses kicked all over the fucking Americas. And here's the thing, Pat. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. So give me your plugs one more time, and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks. Okay. Yes. So the Status Quo Podcast. Me, Matt Freeman, I'm the host. You can find me on Twitter at status quo pod. That's the best way to get a hold of me. We also got an email, the status quo at gmail.com. And our website is the status quo.net. There you'll find episodes, uh, every single one we've ever done, blog posts, articles. Um, and you can find our podcast on just about uh, every podcast you can think of. And if you uh, don't see it on once you want, hit us up. Let me know. We'll get it on there. All right, we're in. So uh, this is a special episode of mine. I think it's going to flow really nicely. We got someone with also who was a uh, military veteran and has some really interesting perspective on the military and government, much like I do, and we resonate together pretty well. Um, why don't you introduce yourself tonight? We got Matt from the Statist Quo podcast. Thanks, Pat, and thanks for doing this too, man. I'm definitely looking forward to talking to you tonight. So my name is Matt Freeman from The Status Quo Podcast, and that's S-T-A-T-I-S-T. -I, -S -T. I know, not a word you see a lot in a common lexicon, but anyway, I'm an Army veteran, I'm an ex-convict, and now... Uh, <laughs> I host a podcast... Uh, mostly dedicated to anti-war, uh, liberty topics. We, we do a little bit of everything. We do politics, news, um, military vets issues, you name it, we're on it. Fantastic. And you had me on your show uh, the other day. You were nice enough to do that. That was a, a that was a ton of fun. That was great. So tonight, uh, we've been talking on the phone quite a bit. So I kind of didn't want to hammer this point too much. Um, but you know what? It's important, and we're going to come at it in a way that I haven't heard anyone else talk about it yet. So we're going to do a little bit about red flags. We're going to do a little bit about guns. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mental health, I think. We're going to talk about law enforcement and cops. We're going to talk about government, and we'll see where else it goes. But the first point I have uh, that I brought up to you the other day was uh, red flags are already happening, red flag seizures. Uh, so I'll do a quick little intro segment. So number one, cops have been doing this already and a lot of people don't know that so when you go on twitter and instagram and youtube and wherever you get your news from whatever shitty major news source they'll say what if this happens well it's already happening um, it had been already happening before this became a thing uh and i've had a bunch of different users write into me or call me that were um either active or former law enforcement and confirmed yeah we we used to do that um sometimes you do it with a domestic d dispute so if a husband wife um, get an argument and you show up and there's guns. It didn't happen all the time, but sometimes those guns would get taken for safekeeping. So I wanted to tell uh, the audience something about that, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on it, which was um, it doesn't have to be a court-ordered seizure because in most states, in the eyes of the law, husbands and wives share property. A lot of people don't know the extent of how law enforcement handles that, so... Um, as a police officer, I've responded to people's homes before. As a former officer, I've responded to people's homes. And a husband will say, the wife threw a crowbar at my flat screen TV. And I'll say, great, husband and wife? And he'll go, yeah. And I'll go, have a nice day. It's her property too. She can do what she wants with it. So a lot of people don't know that. So when we tie this into red flag laws and gun laws, a husband or a wife can call the police, maybe one of the, other, one of the partners not home, and they can say, hey, why don't you just take these guns, all of them, for safekeeping? So police do take weapons for safekeeping at the request of the owner. A surprising thing about that is husbands and wives both own all of each other's property together. And you don't need both parties in order to make that happen. So how do you feel about that, Matt? Uh, I think that's absolutely crazy. Uh, first off, 
my real my number one question is how easy is it to get your guns back after they've been after they've been taken for safekeeping well how easy um, is it to get anything back from the government do you think it's, it's pushing a fucking rock uphill man um, indiana yeah. i think it was sorry indiana i think it was uh their red flag law it's 14 days um to uh or the state has to take you to court uh, once the initial order is issued. Um, but uh, gun owners wait an average of nine months to go um, to court for the first time to even petition to get their weapons back. I went and looked that up. I was blown away by that, but not surprised. Well, on every single episode that I have, even if it's just humor or just information, I try and bring value to the audience. So, Let's say that you and your spouse are in a loving relationship, right? And let's say, maybe not even at the hands of your spouse, but at the hands of uh, maybe you're married and you own guns and your wife owns guns or you and your husband own guns, whatever. Let's say a third party complains about one or both of you. Here's some value. As much as I think husbands and wives should, should share and be open and honest and disclose everything, it might not be a bad idea to say, sit down with both parties, the two of you equally, if you're worried about a gun confiscation, if you own guns and you want to protect yourselves and your family, because when the government takes those guns from you, they don't in turn give you a bodyguard for if someone breaks into your home, right? That doesn't happen. So a piece of value would be you sit down with your significant other and you say, listen, uh, I want you to go buy a gun and I'm going to go buy a gun and we're going to do it on different days when we're not home and you come home and you store that gun somewhere and I'm not going to go looking for it, right? So you pick a spot that belongs to you, and I'll never know it. So we have guns that we both own, and we can both use to protect ourselves and our family, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pick a spot, maybe in a, in a room that I choose or in a place that I choose, and I'm not going to tell you about it, but not because I'm lying to you, but so that if the police come in and you're home, if they coerce you and intimidate you and threaten you and you decide to give up all the guns... Well, maybe we're still covered with one or two somewhere. So keeping that from your significant other could end up protecting you and your significant other. Of course, I don't want this to get twisted and it to be, well, if you beat the shit out of each other and then some guns get taken, only one person has them. That's not why I'm talking about this. And I think you know that it, for the most part, this would be protecting you from a third party, not from each other. And of course, I think beating the shit out of anybody for no reason is terrible. Um, and it's also terrible when you do it, if you have a relationship with someone. So I'm absolutely not for violence, but I think that might be a piece of value for you. I think that's a great idea. Certainly beats the, uh, in the backyard approach. <laughs> that kills me. Uh, do you have any bullet points for me? We'll kind of turn the table. Let you do one. So the, I was looking in the Baker Act when we were talking about it earlier, and uh, the text of the law is that if uh, the police can act, if the uh, respondent poses a significant danger of causing personal injury to himself or herself or others. Well, the problem is, is that significant danger is not defined. Of course not. And uh, so how, how does your uh, average police officer deal with that? Sure. Let's talk about that. Um there were only in Florida, uh, when I was in law enforcement, there were only a few ways that you could Baker Act someone, or only a few people could do it. Um, a police officer could do it, a medical doctor of some type could do it, um, and there's also like a tertiary one that's also in the medical field. It's some type of clinical license, something or other, doctor, psychologist thing. But for the most part, doctors and police have the power to talk to you for less than five minutes and go, Yep, we're going to make you a prisoner for the next 72 hours for your mental health, for your protection. So they call it protective custody under a Baker Act. Uh, the things that we had to check off on a list, if I remember correctly, were very short. It was uh, it was like one of these two things, yes or no, and if not, was the other thing, yes or no. And those were, like you said, it was, do you pose a significant danger to yourself or to others? And the way we would do that on scene is we'd show up, we'd go, do you want to hurt yourself? Sometimes people will go, yep. And we go, okay, here we go. Get in the car. Let us let me search you. Cuff you. Let's go. Protective custody. You're not under arrest, but we're taking you to a facility to see a doctor. And you don't have a choice. Uh, the other one was, do you want to hurt other people? And this is very, very common, too, especially with social media, where people will go, of course I don't want to hurt anyone. And I'd say, well, listen, your girlfriend called. 
she said that you posted uh, something like, "Oh, time to go, time to go punch some skulls in," and they'd be like, "Yeah, of course I'm not gonna punch somebody's skull in. Like, look at me, I'm 110 pounds soaking wet." Uh, you know, it was about a football game, and I'm like, "Okay, cool." Um, the problem is, there's a liability monkey on my back now. So the person, ha- so the the seesaw doesn't have to be even. It has to be flipped more in favor of the victim than it is law enforcement. So if I walk away and the person does punch somebody's skull in, my ass is fired, in trouble, written up, uh, maybe in court, maybe going to jail for culpable negligence or whatever term you want to use, right? So you have to work really hard as a victim, as a as someone who may, may or may not be a threat. You have to work extra hard to get that liability monkey off my back. So a lot of people don't know that either. Um, so... When in doubt, we're told, go ahead and do it. Worst case scenario, they go get some help. They don't need it. Whatever. They're out in a few days. Uh, phrasing, worst case scenario, I wrongfully violate someone's human rights. So uh, that's what a Baker Act is. It's usually if you're going to hurt yourself or others. Or the third one is, are you unable to provide basic human care for yourself? So that's people that have, um, like people that are like seeing demons or people that can't communicate or can't physically move, uh, things like that. So someone, if, if you walk away, they're not going to be able to eat food. They're going to die, right? Uh, so those were the Baker Act criteria. Uh, there's another one that's really similar. I'll just breeze over it real quick. It's called the Marchman Act in Florida. Uh, it's basically the same thing. You're not able to provide care for yourself or you're making decisions that are so fucking wild because of a substance abuse issue, whether it's alcohol or drugs. So if you see someone that's fucked up, like beyond reason, you can marchman act them. So you're not arresting them, but you're detaining them. You're bringing them to a facility where they can get medical help and then psychological help as well. And then that's usually like a one to three day ordeal also where they don't have a choice. So Baker acts and marchman acts, you are depending on not the legal definition, but the human definition is you're imprisoning someone against their will. And it's not necessarily always correct because of course it's a very subjective issue. So after you've been detained and you've been taken to a medical facility for that 72 hour hold, uh, some type of medical personnel has to evaluate you, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they can, if their opinion is that you need to stay, they can hold you for a longer period. Is that right? Or do you have to go to court at that point? Uh, I I never dealt with the back end of that. Um, I don't know all those details and I sure as shit, I'm not going to pretend I do. Um, I. I forget if the phrasing is it's a minimum of 72 hours or a maximum of 72 hours. I forget which one it is, um, but you you can expect it's more than a few hours. And yes, you, you are required to seek to see uh, a mental health professional. So they the state will provide that for you. So what we have here then is is a law that essentially allows the state to to pick up anybody they want with essentially just one signature from a medical professional or a cop um, or a cop. Well, yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was our cop too. Yeah. So that's, that's huge, man. You know, this really reminds me of, uh, I mean, honestly, man, it's, we're seeing the weaponization. If zoom out a little bit, we're seeing the weaponization of mental health in our society. Well, and, and this is a, a cycle too, cause this was a big deal. Um, I mean, this has happened several times throughout our history. Think about the, um, I mean, it's really similar to, uh, what was it, uh, the commie stuff going on in the um, the Cold War or post-World War II or was it pre-World War II or during it? It was if your neighbor is, you know, if your neighbor's doing something suspicious, he could be a commie. Turn him in, right? I see something, say something now, too. After a post-9-11, um, same thing where we have people just disappeared off the face of the planet to who knows where. And... Speaking of which, too, uh, the Patriot Act. Um, at, back then, I know it's almost 20 years ago, but I remember after the Patriot Act was signed, there were a few people that were, I mean, mostly commies, talking about how the government was going to use it to spy on regular people in context that had zero to do with terrorism. And they said all these powers were going to be abused. And people pretty much told them that they were crazy conspiracy nuts that hated America um, and they should move. To- they were right. Uh, this stuff is really insidious, man. I mean, 
the 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 foundation that's being laid here for some serious human rights abuses uh you know we've seen all kinds of calls for regulation man but the the red flag laws and those types of laws i think are probably the scariest well and let's let's bring it back to the uh the red flag stuff so they don't have to take your guns they could just take you which a lot of people don't realize and that's been happening for a long time uh, and then if you had guns in the house, they're going to take them for safekeeping too, right? Yeah, and, and they might make that decision uh, with no one present, or they might make that decision with a family member who gives that authorization. Um, and you might not know it until after it's done. Um, so one other bullet point for this red flag stuff is I've had some uh, active law enforcement officers write to me and say, uh, here's a story. It's just a one-sentence story. I uh, had a guy write to me and say, hey, Pat, I had to serve a red flag law injunction the other night. Came from a judge, from a family member to a judge to the other family member. Um, well, from the family member to the judge to the police, right? And he said, uh, I had to serve one of these the other night. It's, called, it's like an acronym, like a, I forget the term, but it's a three-letter acronym. I had to go serve one. And he said, I wasn't very comfortable with it, you know, because cop, believe it or not, most cops laugh at politicians when they're like, we're going to seize all the guns. Cops are like, huh, yeah, right, we're not going to do it. So most cops have that initial sh- uh, initial little shuffle where they go, eh, this really might not be right. Um, and he says, so I told my sergeant, I don't really feel comfortable with this. And the sergeant said, well, we got to do it. So what do you think the officer said? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, at least I told somebody I'm covered, right? Because when you've been, ah, this is a big term too. So let's try not to, let's try to bring this full circle. So this is a big term too, funneling. When you funnel an officer out of high school or college or military, and you funnel him into a career where his retirement is tied to not getting fired and his paycheck and his family's food requires him to keep his job and where him not going to prison, you know, he has to keep his job, um, or him not losing the culture support, right? So if you don't get back up as a cop, you could probably guess that even in a fist fight, you might end up dead. So you yeah. do the things that the cult- culture expect of you. Um, so when you funnel someone into that position where they also don't have any other skills that they can immediately transfer into a similar pay career, right? They're stuck, right? So they're funneled in. When you put them in that position, when the choice is do the right moral thing and get fired, or do the wrong thing and keep your paycheck. What do most fucking people do? They put food on the table, right? Those are some pretty heavy incentives. Um, It's it's that learned helplessness, man, when it's, when it's so much easier to do the wrong thing than it is the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And let me give a piece of value here too. So since we're talking about cops and um, their hesitation or at least resistance to the idea of seizing guns, uh, I think it's pretty obvious if we look at the, kind of the political culture and the moment we're living in here where something's happened in the last 10 years or so where the kind of the, the, the tide has turned as far as the gun control conversation goes. And it's only a matter of time before we get federal gun action. I think that's almost a certainty. Um, it's time to decentralize and shift to the states and localities. And I think it'd be great if we could get in our local communities and give police, you know, through city ordinances to, to not comply with these laws. What do you think? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's my answer. <laughs> That's a tough one to bite off. Uh, local and county and states uh, complying and not complying with federal law, that's a tough one. Like you said in your recent show, the sheriffs are supposed to be a step against the federal system. They're local, they're elected, and they have the ability legally and morally and locally with the local support, they have the ability that when feds show up to make some stupid arrest, they can go, nope, get the fuck out. The problem is, like you said, it's more funneling. Like you said, they've been federalized. So most of these city and county agencies survive in large part because of federal funding. And you think yeah. you think police departments hire veterans because they want to? It's tax, tax, big tax break for them. There's multiple levels of support that they get. So here's something else Something else people don't know. I was a uh, reserve military member while I was also a full-time law enforcement officer. And when I went, I had to miss work 
to go to my military drills, and my agency still paid me while I was away from work for those days. Fun fact, the agency didn't actually pay me. The federal government paid my agency, and then my agency paid me. Wow. I did not know that. Yeah. And there's, oh, that's just scratching the surface. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, no, that check and balance has long, long since been null and void. Definitely, especially when you look at the burn grants and then the 1033 program where uh, cops get so much of their gear from the feds, cast off from the military, and not even like MRAPs and stuff, but even just, I mean, small arms. Um, I don't know about, I don't know about armor and uh, uniforms, but it seems communications equipment, I'm sure, probably a lot of it comes from the feds. Uh, it's huge. And then also, what is it? The um, civil asset forfeiture is the other big one, too. Mm hmm get to split the uh, proceeds of um, assets seized so yeah you have all these humongous incentives lining basically you know really turning the police department's interest away from protecting community and it towards in sort enforcing federal regulatory schemes let me i i said this on jack spirko's show on the first ever podcast that i was interviewed on someone else's show a long time ago i don't know if you're familiar with it but i think this might blow your fucking mind um, I want to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure we all know that people embellish stories to make themselves feel important. So maybe <laughs> part of it was that, but it definitely can't be all of that. Like there's gotta be some truth to this. So I'm still an active deputy, um, in Florida. I was either still in field training or just after field training and fingerprints were a big deal. Uh, collecting data as a cop is a really big deal. Uh, mental note, I'm going to do a whole episode on that. So fingerprints were a big deal. So much so that our agency had a program where if a crime is committed and no one is arrested, like we don't know who did it, like who done it. If I show up and there's a crime scene and if I dust for fingerprints and I take the fingerprint card and I send it to our fingerprint guy in the agency, if they find a match and an arrest is made... I get a free vacation day, of course, at taxpayer expense, but I get a free vacation day. So really? me being the person I was, I dusted at every fucking scene. People were like, oh, I don't know who did it, but it's not a big deal. I'm like, hey, can I dust for that? And this 5% <laughs> issue, you might have heard me say this, 5% of cops or less took advantage of that. So cops would go to a scene and there'd be a burglary and the person would be like, can you dust for fingerprints? And the cop, most most police officers are like, they just want to clear the call. They want to go home. They want to go sit in their car somewhere else. Not all of them, uh, but some of them. A, a, a good chunk of them are, are like, the less work I have to do, the better. And that's human nature, too. So a lot of cops would be like, fuck it. I'm not dusting for prints. I, I have to go get it out of my car. I got It's sticky. I got dust everywhere. I got to use this tape. It's always a pain. So a lot of cops don't do it. I ended up getting a few vac free vacation days for finding a good print on a, on a burglary or any another type of crime. Uh, so... I'm going to get back on track. Uh, I met with the guy at my agency that was in charge of the entire fingerprint program. Here's what he told me. Hey, deputy. Oh, hey, guy. We've never met. Oh, no, we haven't. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what I do as a fingerprint guy. Oh, okay. Well, you know that, uh, you know how people come in here? Because most people go to police departments or sheriff's offices or they'll go to like a UPS store to get their digital fingerprints taken. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. Okay. Just did that. Well, here's something you might not know. The guy continues and he says, well, you know that fingerprint machine we got down there? Yep. The one by the, like the main entrance where people walk in and they go, Hey, I want to get my fingerprints. And they walk to that room with the big fingerprint machine. I'm like, yeah, I'm aware of it. And he says, oh, well, you know, it's nice because, you know, the people, well, we didn't have to pay for that machine. That's nice. I'm like, uh, okay, I don't know why you're telling me this, but okay. And he's like, and, uh, you know, we get a couple bucks for the agency when someone, you know, comes in to get their fingerprints. And I'm like, okay, yeah, people pay for that service. Okay, good. And he goes, and uh, that's a nice perk that the feds, uh, you know, let us, they give us the machine for free. And and then we get to keep the, the money that people come in and pay us. So that's good funding for us and didn't cost us anything. Do you have any idea where this might be going? Oh, I know exactly where it's going. Not only does he say, 
well, we send all those prints straight to the FBI, NSA, DOJ, all, all these different places. You name it, we send all these prints back up to the FBI and whoever else wants them. And I'm like, well, A, I didn't really know that, but B, it's not a big surprise. Okay. And then, on top of that, he says, and you know those cameras we got in the lobby, the really good Space Age ones? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And he says, well, you come in and get your fingerprints done, and there's a timestamp on that. And we can also take those videos that they also get sent up with your fingerprint files and with all the other data we collect. That goes up to the feds, too. And I'm like, that's a little cr creepy, but okay. And then he says, everyone gets a little folder, and whoever's in the lobby, even if they're not related to the person getting fingerprints, everyone in the lobby at, the, at that time, we take a photo and we get that video, and that also goes to the feds. And I'm like, holy shit. These are people in a police station lobby of their own volition, not mm -hmm. exactly, uh, you know, the criminal underbelly of our society. But, dude, I, it's got to be the same thing with uh, ALPRs, like license plate readers. And mm -hmm. it's got to be the same thing with uh, now they have the camera footage, but they also have facial recognition that's starting to get pushed out. Same thing with gate recognition where they don't even have to see your face. Oh, they can fuck. identify you by the way they walk. Oh, dude, it's and that's also ties in with the red flag laws man with the amount of surveillance that that we're under just regular people on a day-to-day -day basis um want to target you they have everything they need to do it so I don't, i'm and i'm not for people that listen to the show for any length of time they know i'm not political as in red versus blue or this this senator said this to another senator i don't pay attention to any of that shit um, but this is something that a lot of the people on the anti-gun crowd or what you would call the left that they, they state, um, they'll say this phrase, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to worry about. Let's just take that phrase and let's build on that from what we just talked about. There is so much data collected on you at every level that goes to every agency and you might not even be fucking involved, right? There's so much data that the second they want to make you a criminal, they just flip a switch. Just like, just like the, uh, what's the no flying, the no fly list, right? A no fly, no buy. Imagine if they did the same thing for this poor schmuck, right? Someone goes in to get fingerprinted and they're a legitimate bad guy terrorist, but you don't know, right? You're in there, uh, getting a tax stamp for a local, uh, I don't know, ice cream stand and you're getting it stamped by the sheriff's office. You go in there at the same time as this terrorist. What if they want to flip the switch on you? They just go, you were in there with a terrorist. You're on the no no fly list. You're also on the no travel list. You're also on the no train list. You're also on the can't buy property list. You're also on the can't have guns list. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's so much data collected that as soon as they want to make you a criminal, they can. And that's, that's the you have nothing to hide. You have no, nothing to fear crowd. That's what they don't understand is they might not be bad guys yet in the eyes of the government, but they will. You know, what's funny, too, is that that quote was originally attributed to uh, Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister. Uh, that seems to be the earliest instance of it of it being recorded was in the 1930s. But, yeah, dude, I mean, I'm sure you've read or heard the book Three Felonies a Day, right? I talked about it, that yeah. before. Of course. Yeah. Um, U.S. Code, I think the Federal Registry is something like 7,000 pages just by itself, or maybe it's 7,000 separate codes. Um but you you add that to all the federal, you know, federal, state, local uh, laws. Every single person on this on this in this country commits an average of of three three felony level crimes a day. So if they want to nail you for something unrelated, they already have all the ammo they need. And uh, about this too is like if you ask people just on the street, hey, would you like to live in a society similar to 1984? They'd say, oh, hell no, absolutely oh my not. God. We're here. I mean, what's crazy, Pat, is that we had this thing on deployment. It's called a Jalen's, right? Um, we used to call it Skynet. And it was uh, this uh, weather balloon type thing that was went way high up in the air. And it had a, had a little camera on it. And this camera had enough resolution to see, I think it was like, it could read your name tape at like two miles away or something just absolutely insane like that. And... Um, <laughs> And of course, you know, what what battalion did with it is they would enforce uniform standards with it. 
thought that was the best use for it when they weren't, you know, <laughs> down IEDs and whatnot. But um, this technology is in uh, football stadiums today because the National Security Agency, again, NSA, there or no, sorry, it's DHS. The DHS is responsible for security at uh, football arenas and whatnot. So they have this same camera, same technology in football arenas. Uh, I think was it stingrays, of course, were originally designed for military use, but you, you you see this, you combine what they're doing with it and how much data collecting with the technology and where it's coming from. And we see this, you know, it's like I always say, man, the empire always comes home. It's a, yeah, dude, that's a, that's a hell of a thought. And it's being built up all around us, but you know, the state never does anything in, in big jumps. They, they would never actually ban all, uh, assault rifles but um because that would actually cause people to unify in opposition against the state but when they do these things kind of slowly these one by one like you know red flag laws where they can really they can take anybody down they want to one by one um and you don't have the same level of resistance man so it's so you talked about enforcing uniform standards have you heard my rant yet about the just war it on me dude i've said it before so um some people might be familiar which is good it's important uh let's switch it up a little bit let's bring it i like i really like um what was the phrase scaling scalability right so let's bring it down to the home level let's say it's you and like five family members that live in a residential home let's say right across the street there's a family of five family members that live in that home Uh, let's say that those five family members all grab shotguns and they all rack them and they all start walking across the street towards your home and start blasting pellets into your double out buck or whatever into your front window. Okay. So there's a battle raging. The head of the household, let's say it's you, Matt. What are some things you might want to say? We'll open the floor up. What's your answer? What say you? What, What might you want to do with you and your family? On the ground. Start there. Right. What now, the... let, let's say you didn't want to just lay there and die because they're coming in, right? What would you do? You have defensive position. Right. So st- start mounting a, a d- defense and maybe even turn it into an offense or at least even, even playing field, right? Yeah. Okay. What if I told you, uh, what if you were in my family? What if it was me in charge and we were getting attacked, right? We're all in the same house. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. But before you start taking a defensive position, Matt, you better shave that fucking face. What would you say to me? Uh, I would say, I would say, I would say yes, sir. And I'd also make sure my boots are blossed properly, so you don't have anything else to yell about. <laughs> Good. So you're catching on, right? Oh, yeah. So a, a lot of people don't know this, but in the military, uh, at least in the Coast Guard, and I know in some some other branches too, um, you can be. Fat, lazy, piece of shit, overweight, useless uh, military member. And you can fail your physical fitness test. You can fail at the shooting range. And the response by your peers, well, not all of them, but your response publicly by some of your peers and most of your admin staff would be, oh, you know, let's get you uh, let's get you qualified. Try again in a few days. And that might even be a little aggressive, like, oh, you need to do much better. But it's an atmosphere of administrative issues, right? Try not shaving for the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and showing up Monday in uniform with your shine boots, but with, you know, a three-day stubble on your face, and see what the fuck happens. It's the end of the fucking world. Oh, my God. Like, people might not know this either. Coast Guard has their roots in a a non-military capacity, and they've kept a lot of that, which I like. So you're on a first-name basis with your boss, even your officers. Uh, We don't do ass chewings. Like, if someone flat out fucking screams at you in the coast guard even if they're an officer usually they get a talking to later they're like bro you shouldn't have done that like we don't do that we're largely professional we're largely a life-saving organization uh which was really enjoyable for my career there for the nice for the good things that we did i still don't believe you should be forced to pay for life-saving services um if you're not part of those at the receiving end but i was at least happy that most of our job was keeping shipping lanes open cleaning up oil spills saving pulling people out of the water so we did have, we were, we've been involved in every single major war. A lot of people don't know that. We also have some very active law enforcement jobs that we do. Um, so I show up in my military uniform 
I got a little bit of stubble on my face. And this is like one of the few times that you get fucking yelled at. Like, hey, you fucking forget something today? I'm like, excuse me? Uh, touch my pockets, my belt. I, I'm, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Did you drag a fucking rock across that face today? And, I, and I'm like, you know what? Like, you know who will be standing right behind me? A 350 pound plus overweight, lazy motherfucker who's a higher rank than me and gets paid more than me, who hasn't passed a single physical fitness test, can't shoot to save his fucking life, and he's in charge of a deployable team. A contraband off your face. So, but uh, if it were a righteous war, and if it were so important that we have to send our children overseas to die, shouldn't it be more important that you're a good gunfighter than that you shave your face and have the right uniform on? The problem then is that half of the command staff then has nothing to do. And since, you know, half of the military's purpose is to provide jobs for college grads, uh, I mean, <laughs> priorities here. So if it were a righteous war, the priorities would be very much shifted. So I, it's pretty clear this isn't, this has been a hundred years long of war as a racket. I agree more. You got anything else for me? You got any, any other bullet points you want to bring up? I've, I got just a couple more here. Um, I had one, but it <laughs> uh, zoned out for a second and Sorry. it's gone. Um, here, come back to me. I'll All think right. of it. So I'll fill the gap. <laughs> so the last one I had here was just a segment on actual cops. Um, I think a lot of people know my position on it. I was in law enforcement. Um, I am not blindly anti-law enforcement. I'm also not blindly pro-law enforcement. I want to build a bridge between people that are on the cusp of moving towards liberty. Uh, so I like to talk about things that are factual about cops, not necessarily pro or negative. Uh, so here's some things a lot of people don't know in the liberty movement. There's cops that in their own circles online are sending memes back and forth, just fucking laughing at politicians. Like, yeah, right, we're not seizing guns. That's good. A lot of people don't know that in liberty movement. They think, oh, 40% of cops beat their wives. Okay, great, but... There's also cops out there that you might want to get on your side that are like, no, I'm not seizing guns. Good. Maybe liberty movement. You might want to start a conversation with those people like, good, why not? Oh, interesting. So should people own themselves? Oh, cool. So maybe plant those seeds instead of turning every fucking person away because just as much as being blindly pro-law enforcement like the bootlickers, it's probably not very beneficial to be blindly anti-law enforcement. Uh, we talked about funneling, being funneled into a retirement plan, having no other workforce skills. Um, so when you put a cop in that funnel, it's really hard for him to move out of it. So another piece of value, I, I've said this a lot. If you're in any type of government job, if they haven't yet, they will make you do something that's against your morals that you know is wrong. Or the political winds will shift and you'll get fucking fired. So... To make it easier to transition away from a job, should either one of those two things happen, start a fucking hobby. If you can, turn even if you don't make a ton of money, turn it into a small side business so that if something fucking happens, at least you can buy yourself groceries for the weekend and you can do a little more of that hobby to make a little bit more money. Um, I recommend everybody leave law enforcement. That'd be great. Um, but do a little bit to help yourself make that mental decision of should I stay or should I go? Well, if I stay... I'm going to break my fucking morals and it's going to suck. And I'm going to be miserable. If I go, I'm going to make a little less money, but I'll survive. That be, that's If I can do that for one cop out there or one military member out there, I'll call this podcast a success. I think that's a great piece of value for anybody. Yeah, even in the corporate world. There's people who work for fucking AT&T that hate their lives. Start a fucking side hustle. And you don't, you don't have to do everything at once, right? If you want to, like Gary Vee says and Jack, uh, Jack Spierko say, if there's people out there that will pay money to listen, to read articles or listen to podcasts or watch YouTube videos about stormtroopers reenacting the American Civil War. There's people <laughs> that will pay money for that, enough of them that they'll support your annual budget for income. So pick something that you enjoy doing and do a lot of it on your off time. Even if you don't monetize it, you can figure that out later. Just pick something that's not related to your job that you're good at and go with that. Yeah, I think also, you know, it's also 
for, especially for people, military, law enforcement, man, high stress jobs, it really just beats you down. I think it's also really important uh, to to find something that's cathartic for you. Um, little time actually interacting with the physical world in our in our modern lives that that's something that's really huge. It's helped me certainly quite a bit uh, on my you know, journey home. You know, actually, Pat, while we're on it, yeah. I did want to go back to something you said when your bullet points about not being blindly pro cop, but not being blindly anti cop either. And got me thinking a little bit about that because, um, you know, <laughs> people, if you know my backstory, I mean, I spent I spent three years in prison. I had an axe to grind for a long time. Um, you know, got got shit done by cops plenty of times while I was in the system. Uh, so I used to always be like, oh, fuck cops, you know, 40% of cops beat their wives, blah, blah, blah. But something happened to me. I spent uh, <laughs> I spent an entire day arguing back and forth with some with some you know, some moron on Twitter, which, yeah, I know it's, it's my own. I did it. I did it to myself, <laughs> but, um, we were talking about, uh, I was somebody else sent Trump sending troops to Saudi Arabia. And, uh, this, this said, Oh yeah, all American soldiers are murderers. You know, you, you're, uh, you, you have no excuse for not knowing what you were going to do when you were over yeah, there. And I, I was remember. like, yeah. And I was like, look, dude, I mean, you know, people are propagandized since birth here. Um, the vast majority of us knew nothing about what going to war actually meant until we did it. And, uh, and that's when it hit me, man. I'm like, okay. So if, if I'm in the military right now, if I'm still drinking the Kool-Aid and this person talks to me and I see, happen to see libertarian in their bio, I'm going to say, man, fuck these libertarians that are my approach with the way I do things, which, Hey, there's plenty, to, there's plenty to criticize about modern law enforcement, but I think you can do it in a way where you're not just totally turning people off to the message. And I think part of our job, if we want to grow and expand living in our lifetimes, we got to be good ambassadors for it. You can't just uh, spit all the facts out and expect people to, to agree with you because you're so right. No, you got to be a, uh, at least a somewhat pleasant person. And, um, calling you know calling people that work for government government jobs you know welfare queens and whatnot it's probably not going to help your cause so just a thought there i get that and one of the things i tell a lot of my people that are my friends in the liberty movement even if they're just internet friends which are great um i, I this is a big uh mindset changer for them i tell them do you know what cops say about you and they're like what do you mean say about me i'm like if you say you're an anarchist, voluntarist, libertarian, whatever, if you say you're an anarchist, you know what their memes about you are, right? All you fucking do is throw bricks at windows and light shit on fire. I'm like, is that true? And they're like, of course that's not true. I'm like, okay, well, all cops don't beat their fucking wives either. So if you're both grinding up against each other, no one's going <laughs> to win. So just as much as you don't want to be called, you know, a rioter, they don't want to be called wife beaters. Um, I have some other, did you ever look up that study or did you just hear that study? Oh, not... Which study was that? Uh, 40% spousal abuse. Uh, I don't think I've ever looked it up. No, I did. a. I did a little bit of looking it up. Um, I spent maybe 30 minutes working on it and I found, uh, I found out that it was done in like the either late eighties or early nineties. So it was done like on paper. So not in the digital world and it was done. Um, and the, the phrasing on it that I remember reading, we can go into it in another episode maybe, but the phrasing was something like families who have an officer in their family have at one point experienced some type of family violence. So it wasn't even necessarily cops come home and beat their wives. It was there's some type of violence in the home. So it, it might have been like sibling on sibling. It might have been mother on child. Who knows, right? Um, uh, and that was also a time when you couldn't just run a cop's license and a domestic battery would pop up on his screen and you'd fire him. So in 2019, uh, we had our, our sergeants had to run our licenses uh, once, a, once every quarter, I think. So every 90 days during squad briefing, uh, we'd hand our licenses to our sergeant or at least our license number and he'd run it and he would check for wants, check for warrants, check for domestic violence arrests, things like that. Um, so it's a very dated uh, quote or study. Um, 
I, I know there are definitely cops that beat people up and that do it to family members, but that study was done when those gaps in the system were huge and they were paper driven. So if you get arrested out of county, no one will fucking know for years and years and years. Now you get arrested out of county, your department will know the next day, if not that same night. So uh, I love I love when people use that analogy or that quote. Uh, and the, the other part is 40%. Great. So the other 60% that don't, how do you think they feel about you saying that all the time? Like, are you are you getting them on your side or not? Yeah, they're sure as hell not going to listen to what you had to say. Um, I try to make this point, and I've been trying to do it more lately, is that it's not it's not the people that that go into these jobs, man, because um, there's in the guys in my unit when I was in the army, I'm just poor kids, man. You know, just regular regular people. I mean, to, to use the phrase, uh, it's the system, man. It's a system that, that forces people into violent confrontations because of the war on drugs. It's a system where, uh, you know, departments are short staffed, understaffed. Uh, guys are working, you know, long shifts with very little sleep, which really fucks with you. It's and especially gives you a very short fuse dealing with high stress situations because of all the all the laws in society and the things that we ask things that the state asks their their enforcement wing to do so the people in it is just i mean it's just not what we're trying to do at least not doing it for its own sake i mean if there's like you know an an, an individual instance where you can say oh, okay this person did this they should be fired and they're not well that's one thing but yeah that's a, <laughs> I had no idea, dude. That's a tortured statistic, and you hear it all the time. So it's just like, and, and again, I, I am absolutely not pro cop at all. Period. I'm not either. Hundred percent. I am not pro cop. When a cop gets behind me in traffic, I literally fucking swear. I'm, I'm like those motherfuckers. <laughs> I drive past them. I see them pulling someone over, and I'm like, great, steal for some more fucking people. Great, feed that fucking like I get pissed. Right. I'm not pro cop however i also think that if we're going to make any progress we have to understand humans and we also can't lie to ourselves just to make us happy it's the same thing that the other side does yeah that's that's a yeah that's not useful at all um and i think about it from my perspective man uh, that that conversation um, nobody called me a baby killer in quite a while of course i've been off social media for a long time but i think the last time somebody called me a baby killer was at a p protest in like <laughs> 2000 2008 right and so you, and what'd you do did you did you say yeah you're right i'm so sorry or did you put your shield up I said, yeah fuck these motherfuckers oh. and you know fuck yeah and it's like that it, it poisoned it was it was jane fonda dude Jane, it, the, the poisoned the whole fucking anti-war movement for me for a long time and then you know, this recent episode, I was like, oh, this is probably not, you can even be right about whatever you're saying, but it's not the best approach. It's, that's really large too. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about more, a little, oh, well, I'm, I'm exactly at my limit. I'm one and a quarter drinks through my what am I drinking? The last of my Hudson baby bourbon whiskey and Coke. I forgot uh, to ask what she's drinking. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to. I'll, I'll, I don't fuck it. I'm, can you tell? <laughs> All right, I'm a cheap day. I don't drink. The only time I drink now is when I record. That's my, that's my only time I drink ever in life. And I'm going to probably stop doing that too. Um, I quit, totally. Let's bring it back to firearms. Let's bring it back to uh, red flags. And let's talk a little bit more about government. Uh, I want to consider this point. I'm sure you're going to have some good thoughts on this. We disarm the public piece by piece, like we've already both identified. I'm sure most people have identified. It's a, it's, you know, it's a war of attrition. You take a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, just like the boiling frog, right? We disarm the public with these new red flag laws by disarming the easiest people to, to uh, victimize, right? So people with low income, people that aren't rich and famous, people that don't work for the government, right? People with mental health problems. People with mental health problems. So when society looks as a whole, society sees, oh, 
we took all those guns from a uh, uh, some some dude that couldn't even pay his fucking bills, right? What a loser. Good. Who yeah. cares if he has guns? Why doesn't he get a fucking job, right? Of right. Co- so, this is so, this makes me so sad, man. If you're not going to stand up for other people's rights, who the fuck do you think is going to be there to stand up for yours? And the government knows this. They are not going to go door to door with tanks to take your fucking guns. Of course they're not. The second they do that, it's over for them. They know it. So, they start with the the easy targets. Yeah, this is their MO, man. They always try this new... And whenever they're infringing on our rights, which is always, they all, whenever they expand into a new area, they always start with the the least popular people. Look at Julian Assange, man. Um, he's a perfect example because when they were using still in prison, the Espionage Act against him, that's a whole new thing about prosecuting journalists for printing national security, quote unquote, secrets. Right. That was a new thing. Journalists had always been kind of like a protected class. But if it's like you see how much he was demonizing the media and both the entire left wing and the right wing were like, oh, we hate this guy. He's mean to his cat and he slings shit and the, you know, he rides a skateboard and he smells bad and he looks phony and we hate him. And that was the entire conversation that that both sides were having at this time was that, oh, well, he helped Trump get elected or or and then the right was like, oh, well, he killed a bunch of soldiers in Iraq because he, you know, released like secret, even though if you can look in, at the Iraq war logs, all it is is a bunch of sig acts. It's literally nothing that's tactically useful. But anyway, they're trying to have this new thing on somebody that everybody hates. And if they can get away with it with him. They'll get away with it for any of us because that's what people – I try to pound that into people's heads. And you see it just with common criminals where um, somebody will be arrested and they'll be denied due process or something will be shady with the proceedings. And people will be like, oh, well, screw that guy. He's probably He probably did it anyway. Who cares if you know uh, he didn't get bond or if he, they, they denied some motion? They always do that, but they never realize – they never, ever realize – that guy's rights, that child molester's rights, Julian Assange's rights, whoever, his rights are your rights. And if he doesn't have any, well, guess what? <laughs> you don't either. That's so sad. That's one of my one of my favorite memes ever, definitely in my top 10, is the one that uh, says something like, the thing the government fears the most is uh, gays and blacks and the Jews and the this and the that, all, all accepting and understanding each other and being friends. Like, that's what the government fears. Of course, is us standing up for each other, because the only thing that leaves left is the government. Yes, absolutely. And it's a shame um, that we do all this fucking infighting. Are you familiar with the Hegelian dialectic? Have you heard that term before? Yeah, problem, solution, reaction, or whatever order it is. That's it, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and you can see that with solution. every... Solution, problem, reaction? <laughs> I think it's problem... Uh, um, synth- uh, thesis. Uh, oh, forget it, dude. I never went to college. Thesis, antithesis, antithesis, synthesis. There we go. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, you can see this with every single issue, and it plays into why we all are kind of standing around yelling at each other in this kind of circular verbal firing squad. You can see this with every issue, and I think that's probably why tying this back into red flags and guns. I don't think they're going to take the guns until they got all the surveillance and mental health stuff and everything else in place that they want to get out of, because they, they get mileage out of all these controversial topics. If you look at guns where you have, I mean, heck Donald Trump and all them, this has been the best thing that's happened to both these political parties because they're just there. People are just throwing insane amounts of money at them. And that's because that's, we got this, you know, tribalistic partisan society where we're all pointing at each other instead of looking up. And the movement is get people to look up. You said something like four, three minutes ago that made me like really want to ask you this question because I th- it blow, blows my mind. I'm so excited to get your thoughts on this as an anti-war vet. Sure. Um, you said at one point you were bl- blindly patriotic, right, earlier in your life? Absolutely. I cried for the flag me and too. I – yeah. So I God, I used to read book. I still read books like they're going out of style. Um, I read every military and law enforcement book I could get my hands on through high school, and I was getting ready to join the service. Um, and I kept reading them. 
Uh, and I loved the founders, loved them, right? They walked on water. They could do no wrong. And it wasn't until probably a handful of years ago that I finally started to accept the fact that, well, the guys that wrote about freedom had fucking slaves. <laughs> so about that. here's, here's my question for you. Um, specifically being military and understanding how terribly ineffective and, and just what a shitty bureaucracy military is. It hit me probably halfway through my military career that these officers get to write their own evidence about how great they are. There's nothing the enlisted men can do to change that or to stand up against it, right? The books of history will be filled with modern officers from our time that write great things about themselves that are completely fucking backwards. I have a bunch of stories to support that, but let me get to the question. My question is, do you think it's possible that in 1776, George Washington and his buddies were like maybe bumbling idiots that just happened to be super rich and helped each other, you know, hand and fist to, to rise above to be the cream of the crop because of their money or their status? Do you think it's possible that they got to write the, their own evidence about themselves too? And that maybe they weren't as great or as super or as tactful or as smart as we think? Yes, absolutely. And I think I'll take it a step further. I, we have evidence that Washington was a piss poor military commander. What? Um, uh, yeah, how about that? Well, I did not thing. know that, but I'm so happy you said it. Tell me more. Okay. So first off, you have to realize we get we take it a step back. So when the when the founders were uh, dithering around in their powder wigs and their knee breeches, and they were talking about writing a letter to King George, telling them that they were going to write a letter to say that they were free, well, two years before they were doing that, the po- the there's like the small landowners in New England in the colonies had said, you know what, fuck the British, and they threw off the chains of government before anybody had even anything that we read about in history books and the that's the beauty really i honestly i still kind of love the revolutionary period because there's a lot of really it's it, there's a lot of big letdowns in it absolutely but there's a lot of really beautiful things and the one of the beautiful things about the american revolution is that it started as a decentralized revolutionary movement where there was no leader where you had these uh they were called uh, committees of safety and committees of concern that would meet up in small towns and villages and basically they they all planned a decentralized insurgent campaign and um that's when in concord at that time and what had happened is that they were fighting the british fourth generation warfare style insurgency guerrilla tactics hit and runs uh marksmanship marksmanship was huge for these guys back then because you know they're using matchlock and flintlock muskets so of course they have a small powder pan right you have typically soldiers were trained to look away from the pan because obviously you're going to get a you know you're going to get an enormous burn if you don't uh so when british regulars would engage um other forces in combat they were trained. That's what the drill comes from, and that's why they stand in the line because basically their entire formation was used like a giant shotgun against other units. So this is why we have the tactics. We think of it as stupid today, especially you know after being trained in modern combat. Like, why are these guys staying in the line? Well, it's because of the technology. But here's the thing, though, is that the, the frontiersmen and the farmers and whatnot that lived out in the colonies, they'd grown up hunting where you have to be accurate. You have to aim at the target. So, well, skill of marksmanship that the British simply did not, and they used that skill to their advantage. And you had all types of small militia units pop up that would fire from long distances. They climb up in trees with their rifles or their or their, or their muskets, depending, and uh, pick off British officers. They would they would uh, commandeer supplies, uh, you know, steal wagons and whatnot, and they fought beautifully being used as an irregular force but then george washington comes along years later and he had got he had basically he was a rich landowner right he had purchased a commission in the british army um i think he was a second lieutenant or something like that and he never got any further than that and there's a pretty good chance most historians believe that 
if he would have gotten up higher to like a major or a colonel in the British military, he probably would not have signed with the revolution. Here's a secret about George Washington. He didn't just believe in liberty and bald eagles and girls wearing bikinis and, you know, fucking guns and shit, AR-15s. No. Speculator, right? What he would do is he would purchase land in places, assuming, of course, the price is going to go up, and then he would turn around and sell it. Well, the British, after fighting the French and Indian Wars, they said, okay, no more land east of – or west of – a line on the map of america and said okay no more buying land past that well that really made a lot of the land speculators mad because they wanted access to that land but the british had just you know basically broke the bank fighting the french and the indians uh and they didn't want it because they were responsible for the colony security for in large part so that was a big motivation but behind a lot of the founders during the revolution but here's the thing about george washington i'm circling back to this finally yeah. um so you had these irregular militias right fourth generation insurgents um, very unconventional tactics gave the British fits, and it's I've you know I've said this before. It's very difficult for a modern conventional army to do anything well other than fight a modern conventional army. You know, do some pretty drill and ceremony stuff, and have cool uniforms. And so the British had no answer for this type of warfare, and uh, they, they they were give up ground to the colonists well when george washington comes along he decides well you know what we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna make a continental army we're gonna make a regular standing army and that's all cool and everything but the problem is that these militia guys they didn't have any formal military experience not most of them they didn't know what to do they didn't want to stand in a line and get shot at in an open field no they wanted to fight the way they wanted to fight so what george washington did is he took the militia units and he forced them <laughs> into his strategy that he wanted to use and guess what happened the, they got their the asses kicked i know the answer <laughs> they got their asses kicked all over the fucking americas and here's the thing pat George Washington's only military victory was when he fought like an insurgent, when he crossed the Delaware and hacked up a bunch of Hessians that were across the river. Other than that, that won the American Revolution. Um, there's also – I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Um, he had a rival that that is not Francis Marion. Um, uh, there was a general that – was going to replace Washington that actually understood how the militia system worked, how militia units should fight, what to do with them, how to utilize them. And he ended up getting picked up. Uh, um, he ended up getting snubbed. They gave it to Washington because Washington was from Virginia. And that was the reason uh, why he got the job as general's continental army, because they needed Virginia to join in the revolution because it was the most powerful colony. So yeah, dude, George Washington is, is it, and, you know of course he is like the christ figure because that's abraham lincoln but he of the american civil religion he's definitely one of the the highest uh prophets if you will and he's like the guy was you know number one he owned fucking slaves about freedom and him and his him and his you know the founding generation like yeah people also don't realize like the high point of american history at least in my opinion man because it was this libertarian revolution a libertarian war if there ever could be such a thing and what's washington do he turns it into a statist one and he makes the continental army and so on and so forth and what we get is the articles of confederation and when that is done we get the u.s constitution and of course keep in mind people were not happy about the constitution because they thought it was too centralized they thought it was too much you know, central power that the federal government had. And it, the people were pissed about it. So what did Hamilton and John Jay and all them guys do? Well, they wrote a bunch of propaganda papers. They wrote the Federalist Papers. Of course, people don't know this. We look at the Federalist Papers now and we say, oh, this is uh, what, was, what was used to convince the American people to agree with the Constitution. Well, it's probably obvious they didn't actually have much impact. As a matter of fact, what was much more influential was a dude named Tench Cox, who is uh, completely unknown. And if you can look up this guy's quotes, I mean, he was probably like the most pro-gun out of all the founding generation. I mean, he was always talking about how the militia, which is the people, need to be armed up just like the military. And they need, they need to be able to, you know, match ears to the military, essentially. Uh, 
he probably did the most convincing of people to actually agree to the Constitution because the F- Federalist Papers are kind of written in this highfalutin, fancy, very educated you know, style. And meanwhile, the people in the fucking colonies can barely read. They didn't give a fuck about that shit. So anyway, yeah, dude, U.S. Constitution was cute. George Washington, a great general. <laughs> I just – I <laughs> once I came to this conclusion, I thought to myself – Holy shit, my officers, not all of them, but many of them, are trying to get us killed. And there are enlisted men and chiefs and midshipmen or whatever, um, your warrant officers, that are going to these officers and saying, this plan is going to fail. Please, God, change it. And these officers will be like, well, I don't know, maybe. And they change it. And they're like, hey, I had this great idea. It was successful. So once I saw enough of that in the modern military, I thought... Well, goddamn, let me scratch my head for a second. What if, like, we're not exactly reading papers from the people that worked as your enlisted guys for Washington? Those aren't those aren't the things we learn about in the textbooks. What we learn about is the letters to Martha where I'm so great and I saved the day and I got a bullet hole through my jacket, but I survived and I'm super duper. Like, I thought to myself, oh, fuck, they <laughs> might all be full of shit. Yeah, that was, it that makes was scary you, to think that. It is. It makes you wonder too about Patton and um, Grant and Sherman and uh, who else? Or any of <laughs> Lincoln. them? Any of them? Yeah, MacArthur. Let me, yeah. Let exactly. me tell you one about an officer I'm familiar with. I think you're gonna like this. I don't think I've ever told this full story on the show, so this is an exclusive. So one of the times that uh, kind of pushed me towards this realization was. I went on, you know, I went on the piracy patrols, right? For Somalia, the Somali pirates. Yes. Uh, we were very active. We're very good at what we do. So it was a eight man team. There's even a pre story that I'll tell you some other time. We went as an eight man team, and one of us was an officer. We had a lieutenant, and then we had uh, seven enlisted with us that split into a group of four, and then me and my group of four. Um, and we did a lot of piracy operations where we got a lot of bad dudes that we hooked up. So we were responding to piracy acts in action. We grabbed a bunch of people. Um, uh, jump in the gun. Okay, so we, we go out there as eight people, and we split. Four guys go to one ship, and me and three other guys go to another ship. And I was with... The, the, uh... I was okay, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, so I was on my own ship with me and three other Coasties, and we were the, uh, we were the operational and evidence collection uh, and training specialists that we taught everybody on the Navy ship how to operate. Well, we didn't teach them from the beginning, but we got them in line with our training. Uh, we were all team leaders. We, we led teams of Navy personnel. We trained them. Uh, we were on scene and, and administrative uh, control. We were evidence collectors, so we owned the evidence. The Navy didn't. We did all the evidence collection, all the evidence storage, all the processing, everything. And that's never been talked about in the media. Um, although the the U.S. Navy gets highly toted, so Words. we get out there. We split the team of eight into two teams of four. My boat has a lieutenant. We're supposed to train the Navy. The first thing our lieutenant does is gets us all together. He's got no training plan. He was a football player for the Coast Guard Academy, which means now he can make life and death decisions for me. Right? That's awesome. done. Great. So he gets everyone together on the ship while we're out there, and he goes, hey, Navy guys, uh, hey, Coasty guys. Uh, and I, I was the training officer for the team. He didn't give a fuck. So he goes, well, we're going to do some training. Uh, uh, we're going to learn how to leapfrog backwards, how to get away from uh, fire. If someone shoots a gun, what the first thing we're going to do is uh, bound backwards away from the gunfire. What? And I'm like, wait a second. We are quite literally, not figuratively, we are literally the tip of the spear for the Coast Guard. We are in charge of the Navy, and this ship is the tip of the spear for this task force, in an international task force, right? We're here to actually take the fight to these pirates, and the first thing you want to teach us all is how to bound backwards away from enemies as soon as we hear shooting. So you want us to put our backs up against whatever railing we're on and what, jump over? Like, just run and jump and swim and hopefully we'll survive? Like, what's your plan? Doesn't have a plan. Just lines us up and says, okay, pretend you're shooting and then now run backwards. And I'm like, what is this fucking (laughs) retard doing? 
So now this is our first impression, right? It's four Coasties, and we're wearing special gear and special hats, right? And we got a bunch of Navy guys who were excited to do the job and were, you know, somewhat trained and pretty good at what they do. And we're all looking at each other. And the Coasties, me and my other two buddies are embarrassed. We're like, what the? We're like, we don't know. We're shrugging our shoulders. And the Navy guys are like, yeah, we'll do it. But I don't, I don't know why. Like, it's what? So then we catch a few pirates. We arrest them. We detain them. We bring them on ship. Our officer, uh, the first thing he does when we get back from our operation is he throws his rifle on the ground and looks at the three enlisted Coasties, me, me being one of them, and goes, uh, I'm not going to clean that. You guys make sure it's clean. And walks away. He's telling me that was a condition one rifle. I'm like, I don't remember. Probably. Who knows? So I look at my buddies. I'm like, I look at the other two guys. I'm like, you know, we're not cleaning this, right? And one of my mentors, uh, who was an enlisted guy, he's like, he's like, yeah. He's like, he's like, I'll do it. And he's like, you don't have to do it. And I'm like, you shouldn't fucking do it either. And he's like, no. He's like, he's like, listen, we got to play the long game. He's like, just let me do it. And I'm like, okay. So that happened every boarding, and I just, I was numb to it. I refused to touch his rifle. I was happy just, I was happy hanging it off the side of the ship and letting it corrode from salt water, but he probably would have given me that one. I don't know. So he teaches us retreats, step one, and step only. Doesn't really even do a good job at that. Uh, doesn't clean his own gun, throws it to us to clean, right? Very officerly of him, leading the pack. Right? Oh, yeah. Of course, leave from the front. Then I started giving training like I was ordered to, and he never shows up for another training event. Okay. Uh, then, day-to-day operations, we never saw him. Never saw him. He never left his stateroom. Then, we had pirates that we arrested. They were on the ship in a makeshift prison prison cell. And he said to us, uh, make the uh, schedule first. We have, we have to have a Coastie and a Navy guy 24-7 with these guys, you know, for custody. So, uh, you know, make the schedule. Just the three of you guys do it. I'm not doing it. And I'm like, bro, wait a second. I'm like, bro, there's a big difference between a one in four watch and a one in three watch. That's a big difference. So he never stood a single watch. Um, well, what's the uh, what's the kind of crowning moment here? So there was the biggest piracy mothership bust that happened in probably almost. I haven't seen any, anything bigger, but it was a huge pirate mothership uh, that sent out little war canoes to attack other vessels, right? So a little war canoe goes out, shoots RPGs at a tanker vessel, then comes back to the pirate mothership. Uh, So we get there when they're boarding the mothership. So there's like maybe 20-ish pirates on this mothership. And we go on to hit them, right? Before the boarding, we had operated the same way every time. We're really good at it. We all had our own teams. And me and my mentor were always on the same team. We were like peas and carrots. So the officer walks up and he goes, uh... Uh, Pat, you're on a different team. I'm taking your spot. Me and this guy are going together. And I'm like, whoa, can I? Can we even talk about this? Why? What What the? He's like, we're going to board the boat first. You're going to be second. I'm like, he's already said uh, he's going to board the boat. And uh, the lieutenant was going to board the boat on attack boat one. I was going to provide cover on, on attack boat two, which ended up making me famous. So that's fine. Whatever. So... There's a bunch of pirates that, because of our helicopter, with our gun sticking out the side of it, all the pirates ended up moving to the bow of the ship and standing there. So our attack boat number one, with the lieutenant on it, noses up to that boat. And the lieutenant goes on first, because, you know, football, rah-rah. He's a big he's a big dude, like linebacker big, or bigger. So he goes to get on the boat, and l- let's just say this. Let's say you have a boat moving forward in the water. Okay, so the bow is moving forward. Our attack boat nosed up to the left side of that boat, all right? So the port side. So our lieutenant steps over the railing with his left foot first, which means he puts his back to the bow of the ship where the pirate, the armed pirates are. And he gets, (laughs) he gets physically fucking stuck, right? And my mentor, um, gets on the boat after him, but he's, he's now looking over the lieutenant's shoulder to see the pirates. And he goes, sir, I can't provide cover for you because I can't see the pirates because you're in my fucking way. And the lieutenant is st- stuck on the boat. He's so big, he can't turn around. He's stuck. <laughs> so the ho- And then the Navy guys get on, and they all end up going backwards around this huge-ass piracy mothership, and they go around the back of the boat to get to the bow where the armed pirates are. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, 
I got my rifle up and I'm like, what the f- what is going on? Right? I'm losing my mind. Let's fast forward. The fucking... Let's fast forward a little bit. A couple months, right? We get home from deployment, whatever. None of us get asked a question about our vote, right? And all of a sudden there's a big Coast Guard Gala award ball. We're not even invited. It's the people that were on the team doing the job. So our lieutenant goes to this big gala, and guess what he gets? A Coast Guard Guard Operator of the Year Award. Uh, That'll make you sick to your stomach, man. I've literally, right now, I feel like I'm physically going to throw up reliving this. I feel like I'm sick to my stomach right now. So, guess what he gets to write for all of eternity in the record books? Piracy operator, right. Coast Guard operator of the whole year, most tactical guy in the whole Coast Guard for 20, I don't know, what year was it? 20, 2009, I think. This dude couldn't clear a room if his life depended on it, from the sound of it. Oh, dude, I'm sick to my stomach listening to that shit. And you would think, okay, so Pat, is just from like what you, you know, us talking and what you told me, it sounds like this is like a pretty fucking high speed outfit yeah um, for the most part yeah and More yeah than you okay would think. so you, yeah well you you would think that's like a really desirable billet to be the commander of that mm-hmm. so they would put a competent officer with some you know what type fuck it this is my show thing. i get to do what i want right we're at an hour 15 i'm gonna go back and tell the pre-story <laughs> Tear it the I'm, world I'm can listening. suck my dick we're doing it all right fuck you world anyway so this is what happened before that deployment okay I'm on an eight, eight to ten man team, and we have a. Fe- oh, you're gonna like this because weren't you gonna talk about women in the military? I was at some point, definitely. Yeah. Good. Now you have this story you can put in your ammunition. So I was on an eight man team, eight to ten man team at uh, Tactical Law Enforcement Team South. Uh, my lieutenant at the time was a female, and I had thought she was a great leader and a great operator, and she was good at managing her team. I was on her team. Um. The Coast Guard had instituted uh, a stand from they went from a standard PT fitness test into a tier one fitness test, which if you're not familiar with that, that's like the Army Rangers do it. The SEALs do it. All, you know, all these other high speed units do it. Hey, now the Coast Guard tactical law enforcement teams, we do it because we're a tier one unit. We have the capability to deploy around the world. We do weapon transitions. We carry multiple guns. We jump out of helicopters with machine guns. We shoot full auto. We're legit. Okay. I know a lot of people are like to poke fun at the Coast Guard, but we were secret handshake qualified. Okay, so I'm on this team, and they go, hey, we're now going to institute the Tier 1 fitness test at our unit because we're a Tier 1 unit. They gave us warning. They said, hey, every fucking day of the week, the whole unit is going to line up at the pull-up bars because part of this fitness test is five pull-ups and five chin-ups. So hands in, hands out, five of each. Okay, so everyone's like, well, we don't do a lot of pull-ups, and some of us were big dudes and fit dudes and we were operate like we lived to operate we most of us were there because we wanted to be operators and, and we did we did some really high speed shit so now they it's official it's instituted so you've all been training you've all been practicing let's do our pull-ups okay so my team got up to the bar each one of us did a couple pull-ups a couple chin-ups most of us passed our female officer went up and she wasn't very good at pull-ups but we did them every fucking day and she got much better i th- i think i remember that she was able to do like four and five or like five and four or maybe on a good day five and five bad not bad at all not too bad it's great and and i when they when they started it and they told me i was a skinny dude i was soaking wet maybe 130 pounds at the time maybe 140 How much I weighed? <laughs> so um i got my ass in shape i did my homework the time that they instituted that test and made it official i was doing like 10 and 10 and maybe a little more than that so i worked my ass off from one and one not being able to do very many pull-ups at all, I went from that to 10 and 10. Okay, so it's official. We got the new Tier 1 fitness test in effect. My boss got her ass in shape. Great. The team got their ass in shape. Great. Okay. Part of being deployed to the Middle East for our unit was you have to go to uh, like a riverine combat school and a convoy Hummer driving school and an ambush oh school, black water. We went to black water. That was pretty cool for training. Uh, so we were legit, right? Another part was vertical insertion school. So we had to be VI qualified, which means you get into a helicopter. You have that thick, like multi braid rope that you slide down like a fire pole. Fast well, roping. Fast roping. So in order to do that, 
You had to do a fitness test when you showed up to the fast rope school. Part of that fitness test was five pull-ups, five chin-ups. Okay, so we have to go to Africa. Before we go there, we have to go to SWAT school and vertical insertion school. Everyone knows this. Okay, my boss uh, was very busy, didn't take a lot of time, uh, took a bunch of time off, and I think she spent like a week or two in, in Mexico with her family or something. Um, I'm sh- and uh, this is all a true story, so you can be upset if you want, if anyone knows this story, if anyone was involved in this story, or her, whatever. You can be as upset as you want, but this is the honest-to-God truth. I remember that she took a long vacation, went out of country, came back late and drunk, and like showed up like a couple days or maybe the day of the test, right? So our command had a problem with people failing the physical fitness test when they got to the school. So they said, we're going to do a pretest before we send you to the school. I'm sorry that I'm yelling. I'm just passionate. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's all good. And I hope people are, I hope that I'm saying this coherently because I've, I've had maybe almost two full adult beverages now. You're so, good so far, man. Which is rare. Our commanding officer, which I think was in 05 or in 04, and then his XO bring my eight-man team to the gym on base. And my lieutenant is in charge of our team, so the whole team is there. And because so many other teams have had people kind of like some people have failed their fitness test, our, our commander was present during the testing to make sure we were squared away. And that was unusual. Usually it's just like you get a training staff guy who's like a – you know, uh, an E3 or an E4 or an E5 who signs off on the test, but our commander was there. So we all line up at the bar. I jump up and I do like fucking 13 pull-ups and like 15 chin-ups. And I'm like, here I come, Somali pirates. I'm going to kick your ass, right? I'm, this is my life. I better do the fucking minimum because that's what my paycheck requires, but I did way above that. And a bunch of the other guys did pretty good. I think the uh, our our lieutenant, our female, in charge of the team, who knew, who used to be able to do this test, if I remember correctly, um, and who's in charge of our team and who gets paid three times what I get paid, because we hold our officers in such high esteem, she jumps up on the bar and she can't get three fucking pull-ups. Ah. Uh. This next part is very, very, very important for the audience. If you stuck around and listened to me yelling into your ear, ear balls, this is important. Thank you for sticking around. Okay. So the commanding officer brings the whole team outside the gym, and we're standing in this little overhang, and it's private. So it's the CO, the XO, and the eight-man team, including my female lieutenant. I'm, like, nervous for her. I'm like, oh, God, he's going to fucking embarrass her. And, like, I don't know if if she's going to even be able to go. Maybe part of me was expecting that, like, they'll push it under the rug and they'll give her another try. This is what this commander says. I hope you're excited, because I fucking am. So he says... All right, folks, let's hear a round of applause for your team leader. She's one of the best we've ever had at the unit. Oh, Nothing was addressed. Uh, oh, okay. Good. I, I'm looking left and right, and, of course, the culture expects you to clap. So if everyone else is clapping and you you don't, oh, boy, right? So I, like, do a really slow, like, one clap. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and he goes, she's worked so hard, and she's done such great things, and I hold her in such high esteem. This, She's terrific. And I'm like, uh, okay. And then he says, well, you know, we're going to get you a stand-in officer, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, someone else is going to be taking your team to Africa. But, uh, you know, we're real proud of her. And, uh, you know, th- I, she's doing great things. She's going to continue to do great things. And I'm, I'm, I start now I start to get angry. I'm like, are you fucking high? What did I just witness? Are you high? So... Yeah. Now I'm thinking, what if it was me? What if everyone passed, including her, and I failed? And I did four pull-ups and four chin-ups. I couldn't do it. Would he be saying the same exact thing about the most qualified operator, the operator that spent the most days away from home port, the operator that had the most drug arrests out of anyone in the unit? Would he be saying that about me? Like, you're so super great. No. Of course not. He would have been like, this is, what a shame. You've wasted everyone's time and energy. You can expect to sign paperwork in my office later. Of course that's what he would have fucking said. Yeah, there, dude. <laughs> no, I'm I'm fucking mad now, dude. The the oh so that God, was pre Africa. Then we had that idiot, the lieutenant, the linebacker lieutenant, who took us overseas right. and got operator of the year. Fucking crazy, dude. Okay, so this is your military. Um, this is your government. This is the best we've got. 
Uh, yeah. All right. Quick, quick story here right now. So we're pulling, we're pulling guard and it's me, the LT and Sergeant and I'm pulling guard. I'm a fucking medic. I'm not supposed to be doing this shit all, but we're always shorthanded. So I'm pulling guard just so somebody else can get some rest. And this white van comes, comes rolling up to the ACP. It's just like a Ford, like a newer Ford, like, you know, E250 van. It's moving pretty fast. And we asked to see if, uh, contact with the fucking ecp so uh this van's flying up and we're kind of standing there looking at it lieutenant say light him up and we're like you heard me fucking light him up <laughs> sergeant says no nobody's fucking shooting anything we haven't had we don't have any id we are way out of the arteries we're not doing anything of this nature and they're having a fucking shotting match like back and forth Okay, so the van rolls up to the gate, and it's contractors. He and I both said it was in the first place. It was too new to be an Iraqi vehicle. It wasn't a fucking <laughs> brand new VBID, and uh, nothing happened. Nothing ever. Nothing ever came of that. Um, that same dude later on, uh, and he ended up having like a severe fucking alcohol problem, like showing up, like coming on duty drunk, like getting wasted all the time. And he ends up his last uh, duty station in the military is at a fucking rehab paid for with tax dollars uh, where he gets to hang out, you oh. know, and talk and say how great he was and, you know, how awesome he is. He did this and did that. And uh, he gets out with a fucking honorable discharge. Meanwhile, myself, I, I failed a drug test for an illegal drug, but I get an OTH discharge. So, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's no difference in treatment here. I feel this is cathartic for me. I'm happy I got that out. I don't think I've ever told that full story, either of those two. It's sad, man. It's, there. For, if people out there think that we all get treated the same, they're out of their fucking minds. And if they think that officers or whatever rank you are, the higher your rank, the higher your esteem is held. Uh, if people think that, they're out of their fucking minds. <laughs> hey, I was on mute. Oh, oh. Sort of like <laughs> we're good. We're recording now. So if anyone is confused as fuck, you're not alone. Oh, we're we're good. <laughs> Yeah, I heard I'm everything you said. Alone. I heard everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh man. You know, burns my ass too. Last thing I'll say on this topic too. Okay. So, um battalion staff, S shops, any officers, um platoon commanders, company commanders, if they go on a combat deployment, each and every single one of them gets a bronze star. There's a bronze stars awarded. There's like and this is what's so crazy is that they have the okay, so you can be like a fucking private first class. You can you you can be on a convoy, you can get ambushed, you can drag two people to safety, you know, while while being under fire, uh, out of a fucking truck that's on fire. And you might get a bronze star with a V device. Uh that same award is used as basically a hard copy high five for that work in the S shops and just basically push paper all day. That's that is crazy. I've talked about it several times on the show. Um, uh, who says it? Smedley Butler in War is a Racket. He says, and he's a pretty good source, I think, that ribbons and medals were created so that people would want to be in the military and they would want to stay and they would want to follow orders, basically. That's uh, so true. That's so true. And what a lot of people in the public don't know, which a lot of people that join the military initially don't know, but they all th think about this. Who, have you ever met someone in the military who didn't know that people that are higher rank or an administrative staff person are the people with the most amount of medals? Right. <laughs> right? Everyone in the military yeah. knows that, right? You don't spend four years in and think, Oh, if you've got a bigger salad plate on your chest, you're a better person. Like, no one thinks that in the military. No, not at all. So big public service announcement for people that haven't been in the service. Please, God, double, ch like, 
give yourself like a double check or a twice over or whatever. Um, getting a little bit drunk. I had two full drinks, but I'm out. So I'm sobering. <laughs> um, please do a double take. That's the word. When you see someone in a military outfit and they got all these special colors on their chest, please remember that the higher ranking you are, the easier it is to get those. And the more administrative you are, the easier it is to get those. Absolutely. Uh, it ties in with the iron law of bureaucracy. Yeah. Um, man, I said, Generals I gonna... don't support the mission. They support the bureaucracy. Man, there's something I was going to say on that topic, and I cannot fucking remember what it is. Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah. So you know the whole deal with the uh, deployment patches in the Army, right? Um, where you, uh, when you are in garrison, like the unit you're currently assigned to, like you wear your patch on your uh, what is it, left shoulder sleeve. And if you've been on a combat deployment, whatever unit you were on a deployment with, you get to wear that patch on your right shoulder sleeve. Mm, okay. Well, it, it's kind of like, uh, oh, you know, here I was on deployment with, you know, X unit. Okay. Um, so there are units now where they are forbidding soldiers from wearing their combat patches because it's it's up to command, like just like about everything else is in okay. actuality. Um, and they're doing this because some of the younger guys are feeling bad that they don't mm. have one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead serious, man. I got a buddy who's in the reserves who they, they, they told his, and he just does like some, some type of comma shit. They, they just, you know, write down serial numbers on radios and mail in place. I don't know. Something communications. And he, he was telling me, and he was, uh, he was down at Fort Hood. I mean, he was telling me that, yeah, man, they, they told us to take them off. You can't wear them anymore because somebody complained to command. Oh. <laughs> somebody complained to command. What's her that, name? Karen? <laughs> somebody who complained a fucking command that yeah they were they felt bad because they didn't have one and instead of you know commander saying oh well we'll see if we can get you on like an individual augmentee if you want to go to a deployment or something like that no it was just oh you guys you know <laughs> we can't have hurt feelings so you guys can't wear these that's uh, oh my god <laughs> like the uh last thing i'll say on like the new thing with the army fit PT PT test, they've completely revamped it. Um, it's supposed to be much more like functional fitness. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you do a deadlift with a trap bar and there's like some, you do like commando pull-ups, but you have to like tuck your legs up the top and they've been like rolling it out slowly. And females for this test have like an 11% pass rate. Women in the military. And it's supposed to be like a genderless PT test where everybody has to meet the same standards. Oh my god, dude! I'm so happy we're talking. I'm fucking over it. Oh, me too, dude. Fuck, fuck all that shit. I mean, I've been over it for a long time, but it's it's awesome that you know I got I got I got guys, you know, Liberty friends that to shit. Let's well, <laughs> do another public service announcement. I'm sure I'm I'm gonna speak for you, and if I'm wrong, <laughs> let me know. But I'm gonna try and speak for you and me. If you're out there and you're listening. And you're a current or former veteran, either law enforcement, military, or something similar. And you understand and you feel these things. Write to us. Both of us would be happy to hear from you, even if we don't interview you, even if you don't do an article, whatever. We just, we I think we both love just fucking hearing from people that understand what the fuck we're talking about. Yes, absolutely, yes. Where can we find it's... you? Because we forgot to do that. And I'll, I'll post that in the beginning. I can do an edit over. Where can we find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. That's the best place to find me. Uh, handle is at statist. That's S T A T I S T quo pod. I got to change that name because it's it's hard to spell. And then um, if you want to uh, email me, email is the status quo at gmail.com. And our website is the status quo dot net. That's where all the episodes are uh, blog posts and articles that I write. And there's a contact form too. But if you want to get a hold of me, Twitter are the best two ways and one more thing my uh my co-host nick is on facebook but if you want to talk to talk to me matt who's the host of the show if you happen to listen uh i'm on i'm on twitter they find you pat go to the website website's home base everything else is lava make sure you get on the website um it's uncensored tactical at uh uncensored tactical.com shit uh, the email is <laughs> uncensoredtactical at gmail.com. The Instagram is the same name. And the Twitter is the same name. 
that's pretty easy. Uh, Discord or I'm a lot. Discord's gonna be changing a little bit in the future. Uh, we don't have it laid out yet, but uh, we have a bunch of audience members. And we have a good core group of people that have been there since the beginning that are providing a lot of value. Uh, but Discord is a great place to find me. Um, how much longer do you got, Matt? You got a jet? I'm good, man. But I did want to come back to what you what you said. Your yeah. uh, public service announcement. I I absolutely agree with that 100, percent dude. It is so. I can't tell you how great it is. I can't put it into words how great it is to talk to guys that have the same mindset. They're just kind of fed up with the bullshit. I'm actually, there's a, um, I have a dude I've been DMing with back and forth right now. I was a Marine vet and he's kind of, uh, you know, starting to get red pilled, starting to see the light. I think him and I are going to do maybe an episode. I'm going to interview him and talk about Lawrence of Arabia. He's been reading into that, but it's just, man, I thought for the longest time, I know I'm sure you did too, that I was alone in thinking these things. Uh, I always had that kind of little thing tugging on my sleeve the entire time I was in. Just tell me like, man, this is, there's something wrong here. There's something really wrong with this shit. Yes. That's, that's one of the biggest reasons I started the website was to tell the public about things that truly happen for better or for worse with military and with law enforcement operations. So I, I love these little moments that I can say, Hey, you'll probably you're probably surprised to hear this. Like, God, I love doing that. You got the mind for it too, man. Like you, uh, I, I'll listen to your show, and you'll say something that I've I've known all along. I just never had the words for it. I'm just like, oh, bam, there it is, and that's an awesome thing, man. So I, a lot of people don't, might not know this either, but I used to specifically study the bureaucracy and specifically study leadership. Um, and of course, tactics out the ass. Um, and I, I had notebooks that I carried with me every fucking day. And when I saw shit that I liked, I wrote it down. When I saw shit that I didn't like, I wrote it down. And I, I got really big on pattern rec- recognition. And I uh, tabulated shit and I formatted shit. I had 10 rules of leadership to live by. I had 10 rules of training to live by. Things like, hey, when you sit in training, you have a... You don't, you can't sit through a lecture for an hour and pay attention to every fucking word. Okay, good. When you teach, remember that your, your students also have that limited attention span. So like I, I would list out things that I saw that need a correction. Um, and a lot of people probably know this by now too, but I didn't just leave the military and leave law enforcement and leave government. I left the bureaucracy. That was a big part of it. Um, so here I am giving public service announcements. I love it. And value, real value. It's awesome, man. Uh, I had one more. Let I mean, if you're not in a super rush, I had uh, one more yeah, bullet dude. point that I wanted to cover. So absolutely, let's do it. This one's going to be on warrant arrests. So you were arrested for a warrant. Would that be, or was that a PC? Do you know? You had a warrant for your arrest. It was a warrant. I'm okay. almost a hundred percent positive. I I got to look in um oh. my paperwork to be sure. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Either way, if if they showed up the way that you told your story the other day um, on the Veterans for Voluntary podcast and on the BTB podcast, um, which uh, I'm, I'm probably going on the Veterans for Voluntarism podcast probably this week or the next week. Um, so I got to link up with them guys too. And the Biting the Bullet guys are awesome. They're great. Um, yeah, it was probably a warrant arrest. When you show up to someone's house and you plan to go in and make an arrest, it's a warrant arrest. So let's uh, yeah, talk a little were- bit about warrants. Sure. I have made several warrant arrests when I was a cop, and here is what actually happens, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, You could have an interaction with law enforcement or not, and either the cop at the time can take that information, and you can both go your separate ways, and he'll write some more paperwork, and then that information will make its way to a judge or the state's attorney, and then back to the law enforcement agency, and then they, they tag your name on it, So the next time that, with a warrant, so the next time that person has any interaction with law enforcement anywhere in the country, um, if they run his name in the computer, it pops up and it says warrant, and it says which jurisdiction it's out of. Sometimes they can extradite you to another jurisdiction, sometimes they can't. So every time that that word warrant pops up, you're being detained until they can figure out whether they're going to extradite you or not. Okay, that's something a lot of people I'm sure probably don't know. Um... Here's another part. Cops don't necessarily know and don't necessarily care 
and they often don't ever fucking check what the warrant is for. Or, well, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll often hear what the warrant is for on the radio. So if I walk up to you and I'm like, Matt Freeman, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm a police officer in my police uniform. Uh, can I see your ID? Sure. Yeah, okay. So I take your ID, I run it, and dispatch will say in my ear, yeah, he has a warrant for his arrest. Um, it's out of this agency. It's for this reason. Like, uh, drug. it's for drug paraphernalia warrant. Or... It's a bench warrant for, for not paying a traffic ticket from not showing up to court, whatever, whatever. Right? They'll, they'll list some type of reason. Besides that, I don't give a fuck. So I would go, oh, okay, Matt, here's your ID back. Turn around. You're under arrest. Here's what, what law enforcement is supposed to do for a normal arrest. Right? I show up. I say, was a crime committed? Okay, do I have the authority to make an arrest? Was it committed in my presence or was it committed before I got here? Because that often makes a difference too. And I'll go, okay, well, I believe that I have probable cause to make an arrest because of this reason, because of this crime. And I've gathered some evidence on scene and done some basic investigating. And I believe it's he probably did it. So I'll go ahead and make the arrest. What happens with a warrant arrest is, like I said, I run your name and dispatch says, yeah, he's got a warrant. And I go, you're under arrest. So cops don't build probable cause based on the scenario and then arrest you for that warrant. What they do is they go, okay, you're under arrest real quick. Boom, like that. So it's a completely administrative process. None of the none of the normal things that right arrest are in play. Imagine if the cop on scene when you have your first interaction with law enforcement is a complete fucking waste of life that can't tie his own shoes and he takes the wrong information at the wrong time or for the wrong reason and he sends that information up and some someone that wasn't on scene that wasn't there that doesn't know the circumstances that didn't ask any fucking questions they write a bench warrant later in another fucking state you can become immediately under arrest and taken prisoner they'll arrest you no matter what they don't give a fuck yeah, they don't know anything about that. Yeah, I, I, I understand that process, and also like it's it's that's just one layer of confusion. What about like misspellings or yeah, so similar that happens, that happens similar a names, lot. right? Same name, same birthday. That yeah. happens all the fucking time because that's when you run people. Usually, you'll say white male. Here's his first, last, middle in, initial. Here's his birthday, and they'll go, "Yep, warrant." So I'll talk to people, and they'll be like, "I had the what? I've never even been in that state." What are you fucking talking about? Now, it's it's good news, but it's only a little bit of good news. Sometimes, in some circumstances, when it's like wildly black and white, like I said, that scale earlier, it's got it can't be like even or a little bit in favor. It's got to be a lot in favor of one party. Right. In some wildly clear instances, the person will be like, "Bro, this is not right." I have, I don't even, I don't know what the fuck that kind of crime even is. I never been to that fucking state where that warrant is listed. I don't know what the fuck's going on. So a good cop, right? Not a bad cop or a mediocre cop. A good cop can go, okay, sit tight. We're going to figure it out. They'll go on their computer. They have resources that they can look shit up and they can confirm things with the person. And sometimes they'll go, bro, this doesn't make sense. You're good to go. Listen, can I get a contact number for you or something? Or like, I got your ID here. I'm just going to write your your address down. If it's you, I'll call you, right? We'll figure it out. But until then, like, you're good to go. Sometimes that happens. So that's good news that sometimes it happens. The bad news is most times it does not, and they don't give a fuck. Because let's be let's take a look without being emotional. Let's take a look at the flip side. How many times do you think, Matt, that I went to a warrant arrest and I was like, bro, you got a warrant? And he was like, that ain't me. Every time. Every time. <laughs> so it's got to <laughs> be like way extra, super duper wild and clear that this is there's no way that that's me. Um, and the last bullet point I had was that you can have an, a warrant put out for your arrest for not having enough money in this country. Oh, a yeah. Of, a lot of people don't know that, especially with things like child support, which I think is wildly ridiculous. Right. Yeah. There's a Ohio's been is has somewhat reform. I'll tell you what, Pat, when I was doing time in, there's a lot of dudes in the joint whose only crime was non supported dependence. And it's like, okay, here's the thing. And this is what really is so is so crazy about the state. So okay, so you're if you're a status and you support this, right? So you say, Okay, parents need to take care of their kids. Matter of fact, 
It's so important agency whose entire job is to make sure parents are taking care of their kids and because we can't trust people to work out agreements on their own we're going to mandate that this dad pays x amount of dollars to his ex-wife in support of the dependent okay wonderful so the dad does this for a while loses his job right and now the kid's not getting the money and this is bad because that kid needs that money because they use it as support right so this is so horrible what we're going to do is we're going to take this guy we're going to throw him in a cage in a place where he can't make any money so therefore the uh dependents don't get any money and then when he gets out he can make money again right except now he's got back child support from all the time he was doing time which is racking up racking up and now he's got to pay even more of his salary and how easy is it to get a job out of prison uh, well, let's see. I think I've told you this before. I think I applied to well, number one. I had to teach myself a skill because the only two things I was able to do getting out of prison was shoot people and then patch them up. So I had to teach myself a skill and I applied to somewhere in the range of 20 to 30 car dealerships before I got the job that I have now. And I am terrified to have because I'm sure I'll have just as much of a hard time getting another fucking job if I happen to get fired. So that was my last bullet point. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, dude. It's, um, and of course, like I said earlier, it doesn't matter when it's not you, right? People aren't going to be standing up for your rights because, oh, well, you did a drug, so why do I care about you? Well, law is the law. Um, and this will be my last bullet point, and anything else we want to talk about is on you. So my last bullet point is specifically for drugs. Like I, I even mentioned it earlier. Another, it was scary. It was like the seed. It, it wasn't the turning point, but the seed was planted when sometime in some of my government training, which by that I actually mean school, they said, what's the definition of drug? Oh, it's a mind or mood altering substance. And I was like, okay, like caffeine and sugar and tobacco and alcohol. Yeah. Right. Anything that alters your mood or your or your brain is a drug. Oh, okay. So do we arrest people for smoking cigarettes? No. We arrest people that put their kids on tons of sugar? No. Do we arrest people for drinking alcohol? Well, sometimes. Uh, so when people say, you do drugs... Well, really, doesn't everybody first thing in the morning in the U.S., like probably 90% of our population, and we support that through media and government and memes, right? You got to have your coffee. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> so it was funny to me when I looked at people like people in the Middle East that they chew, uh, what do they call it, cot, right? And our, oh, yeah. That's so big. You see a picture of a guy chewing cot in his cheek, right, in the Middle East, and you're like, I can't believe they're on fucking drugs all the time. Meanwhile... You're sipping your fucking double soy, double shot of uh, espresso latte first thing in the morning every fucking day of your life, and you're drinking energy drinks multiple times a day, and uh, and they're the ones on drugs, not you. So wonder where I picked up that energy drink habit too. Hmm. Little little piece of perspective for people. Uh, you know who gets to pick which drugs are the good drugs and which drugs are the bad drugs. I got a surprise for you. FDA. It's the people with the financial incentive to do so. <laughs> yeah, that that part too. Public choice theory. There it is. Um, yeah, you know, that's that is that is just it, man. Uh, and people also. This is this is a public service round, and I've actually got one bullet point after this, yeah, which we'll get whatever. to in a second. Um, okay, so here's the thing: iron law bureaucracy. There's also an iron law prohibition. And that that means that the stronger the crackdown is, the harder the enforcement is, the harder the drugs get. Because there's an economic uh, angle here too. Okay, so you worked in counter. Say that again. Angle here too. No. So the you worked in counter. You, I think you cut out. I think it's a single thing. (laughs) Say it slower. (laughs) Say it. What is the iron? (laughs) What is the iron law of prohibition? But first, we got to address this first thing. So the guys in my unit used to call me Boomhauer. Okay. Because <laughs> it talks to them fast. But anyway, so there's an iron law prohibition. Mm-hmm. 
right? This means that the harder the government tries to enforce the law against a certain drug, the more potent that drug will get. Got it. There's an economic angle at play here. You worked in counter narcotics, interdicting drug shipments to the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, there's only a limited amount of space on a boat and has to be carrying cargo that is worth the money if some of those boat shipments happen to get seized and the product gets lost and the boat gets lost. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing now, it started with pain pills, Percocet, Vicodin. Then we had Oxycontin in 1999. That was a big thing for a while. That was my drug of choice for a long time. And then uh, the crackdown on Oxycontin happened. They made it abuse proof, quote unquote. But really all you had to do is toss it in the microwave for a couple minutes. But what happened then was the pill mills down. They started arresting people. They started spending more resources on counter drug activities. So what happened is we've seen the rise of heroin use through America. And they started cracking down on that. They started going hard after heroin. And now we see this fentanyl heroin that is killing people. And they started going after that. And they started people give, giving people life sentences and 25 years for possession or distribution or whatever. And now we're seeing car fentanyl, which is like a 10 times more potent form of heroin. So the point here is that drug prohibition cause of so many of the ill effects of drugs that we deem illegal. To me, that makes perfect sense. Yes. How do you explain it to your average Joe, though, is the question. Well, step one is you have to be willing to look at evidence, and you have to be willing to be wrong. For people to do a lot of times. It's really hard. That's, 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 those two things I just said are probably the only reason that I understand freedom today. Me too. For a lot of us, especially you invest time in the military, when you figure out, when you really see the morality for what it is, man, it hurts. And it's so much easier. I said this on Biting the Bullet. It's so much easier for guys to just keep lying to themselves and and saying like what they did was good or it was important or we needed to do it or, or whatever because the flip side of that is that, oh my God, I've given – years some of, the, some of the best years of my life to this organization which is carrying out immoral objectives and i don't really begrudge people for not being able to get out of that well here's on a good note here's my closing statement um i haven't started it yet but i'm trying to spend some m real solid mental time uh constructing it and what i want it to be and what i want it to do but um, I want to create a local veterans group of like six to no more than 12 dudes um, that are prior military, that miss the camaraderie, that miss the mission, that miss the activity, um, and that we do a, a meetup, whether it's once a week, once every other week, once a month. Um, and I don't have it all worked out yet, but... You're right. It is very hard to look back at your life and go, shit, maybe all that was fucking a waste. Um, you, you, I'm sure you bring things from it. You bring tons of perspective, you bring tons of experience, uh, knowledge you bring from it. But it's tough to say that, oh, maybe that wasn't for the good of humanity. Like, that's a really tough thing to say. You're right. Um, so I want to create a veterans mm -hmm. group. And you don't, you don't have to be, uh, I don't think it's going to have to be specifically for voluntarists, I'm sure. Surely with a little bit of talking, I can convince people to, people to at least accept talking about volunteerism, but um, I'm going to start a, a local group for that. Great vehicle for it. Actually, yeah, yeah, dude, that's a great idea. Um, I've been kind of doing something informally. I've got a couple buddies that we'll meet up every now and then, but I here's, you know, you hit on something that I think is really important to stress, especially if anybody's listening as prior military. Okay. So we are all oriented people. They train us that way. They, 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 they drill that into us. You know, you take one hill and then you take the next, mm -hmm. that's what we do in the military. Right. And soldiers, uh, sailors, coast guardsmen, and I guess airmen too. Um, and Marines, we don't do well. 
we got you got to have a new mission in life once your once your mission for the government is completed or you are no longer a part of it and a vehicle for that and there's so much cool shit you can do it and actually you know Pat, I've been meaning to ask you about the ultimate training munitions. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think of them? Uh, I did. I did a lot of sim munitions and force on force training when I was in the government and in law enforcement, and it is the biggest thing that changed tactical training in the last thousand years. It's huge, right? So, marking cartridges that go in your real service weapon biggest change to training in hundreds of years it 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 turns people into a new phrase called pre-combat veterans so you go into the battlefield for the first time having already survived and died and learned from firefights it fucking hurts when you get shot and just like i was talking about in martial arts today with some of my trainers was uh you can swing some sticks around and hit each other in the knuckles and you know you'll you'll risk it a little bit right I might get hit in the hand a little bit, but I'll hit him in the neck with my stick. Okay, great. Well, take a pocket knife out of your pocket, a sharp one, and point it at somebody and then slash them and see if they try that again. You're not going to want to give up that hand and get cut, right? So it changes things. Training munitions do that to firefights. Yeah, if you're on the range, you might want to stand there with your feet planted, draw your weapon, sight in, take a deep breath, push the trigger to the rear, wait for it to go off. Yeah, yeah, we don't squeeze. You do that in a fucking shootout, you're already dead, right? So ultimate training unit, ultimate training munition, any type of marking cartridge will show you, or paintball guns, right? Airsoft guns. They'll show you that that's not how you do a fucking firefight. You're completely wrong. You often walk onto, I feel so bad for people that all they get is flat range paper shooting training, and then they end up getting into a gunfight. I feel so bad that I'm sorry, but you've probably, there's a 99% chance you've been misled that you think a shootout is going to go one way and that's not how it works, right? So my thoughts on Ultimate Training Munitions as a type of product, well worth it. As an actual company, they've been the worst customer service of any of any type that I've ever received besides the government. <laughs> that's a lot. Done. Well, you know, okay, so two things there. Number one is that that's a huge portion, not some munition, but just fucking just range time. That's a huge portion of your training in the military. And dude, even when we went to NTC, Oh, also, the whole time I spent guarding a fucking gate as a medic. That's what I did. And the only casualty I treated is an ankle in front of me. Real injury. <laughs> but anyway, the um, the physiological response that you get when you're getting shot at with them with that simunition, man, is is the best simulator in actual combat and that is such a huge piece of the puzzle that is totally missing even with blank rounds getting fired at you it's not the mm-hmm. same thing blank that's rounds something hurt. We, yeah that's the well that's the best stress inoculation you could possibly hope for and i have no idea why we're not training soldiers like that today well, all the I, fucking time i got a lot of it uh, but most most people don't get that opportunity uh, we didn't get any of it but um it's you know you guys had yeah, well, my life changing experience was later. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Uh, uh, unprepared. So, give me your plugs one more time, and then we'll wrap it up. Dang. This okay. Time. Yes. So, the Status Quo Podcast. Me, Matt Freeman. I'm the host. You can find me on Twitter at Status Quo Pod. That's the best way to get a hold of me. We also got an email, thestatusquo at gmail.com. And our website is thestatusquo.net. There you'll find episodes, uh, every single one we've ever done, blog posts, articles. Um, and you can find our podcast on just about uh, every podcast you can think of. And if you uh, don't see it on once you want, hit us up. Let me know. We'll get it on there. Wonderful. Matt, thanks so much for spending some time with us tonight, man. I'm hoping that our, especially our vets and and probably some people that are the uninitiated to military, I hope that they found some value and some humor and some really good insight tonight. You were a great guest and I'd be happy to have you on anytime you want, brother. Absolutely, brother. This is is good talking to you, man. And also to vets out there, you, you got questions, you're wondering about this stuff we're talking about, man. You got some ideas. Either one of us, happy to talk to you.